and Jonathan Wurzel. You may have read a lot about him yesterday. He impressed everyone. He impressed everyone with his speech. All the assistants are no longer here, so we will be doing uh, with with the equipment on our own. So, the first question, let's get to business. Question number one is about talents. Yesterday, you spoke a lot about the fact that Ukraine has a lot of talents, but there is a brain drain, people are leaving the country, and the more they leave, the less there is hope for the for the bright future. The problem is that uh, Ukraine does not have a developed inner market and places for implementing the potential uh, that the talented people have. So the question is why the, either you stay or can't develop your full potential or you leave and you leave the country without uh, the potential and you make it less attractive for investors for opening R&D centers so there is a vicious circle. What do we do about it? How can we, um, can you share some life hacks to solve this problem? Um, so yeah, I, I think that they, you know, mobility and uh, is a part, of course, of a modern economy and you can't force people to stay. Um, but you know, you first of all should look at who is leaving and what is their skill. I mean, are these people who are going to do construction and, you know, have a you know, six months, uh, you know, work contract and then they come back, in which case this is kind of okay, actually, it's mm -hmm. not bad. Uh, or is it obviously really high skill people or technology, you know, guys who can, could build a good business in Ukraine if you had, if they thought there was an opportunity. And, you know, for the you know, the, the high skill people, then I think you're just looking at the economic environment and saying, you know, what is the barrier here? Why can't they build a business? And I think usually there are five things. <laughs> so um, the first is money. <laughs> so if they can't get money, they can't build a business. So you gotta get money. And money has to be transparent. You can do friends and family, it's possible, <laughs> uh, but you'd rather have something a little more stable. Um, so there's money. Uh, second, there is uh, safety. Let's call it that. Sort of like if you, I build my business, is someone going to take it away from me? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how do I, how do I keep it uh, for myself? And uh, what is the protection that I get as a uh, small investor or a technology startup? And I think you can fix that. Actually, it's really possible. So. That's one, a second. A third one uh, is uh, physical infrastructure. Sometimes you're in a business where you need a you know, decent road uh, or you know, some kind of a port or something or a power supply actually is kind of a big deal that if the power goes out on you, that's not good. <laughs> so um, so you, gotta fit, you gotta have that. The fourthly, you've got um, uh, companies, incumbent companies. Sometimes when you do a startup or when you try to develop a new thing, you need to work with an existing company. You know, for example, I used to know a bunch of guys who did uh, energy efficiency measurements in steel companies. And you know, if you don't have, if the steel companies aren't willing to work with you, you don't have a business. So that's that's. Well, look, I just so in Ukraine, these three F. Well, Ukraine has these three Fs that you mentioned, food, family and fools. So the first investments, so there is um, in the startup, uh, there is this three F abbreviation. Here we do not have it because people do not have savings. People, it's, it's not even possible to take uh, money from the, the income that you get and invest in your business. Well, as far as physical structure is concerned, it's okay, more or less. But Ukrainian companies do not have uh, in resources to invest into R&D and attract specialists to work in high-tech uh, research and development or production. But all of us are expecting some sort of miracle. I mean this period, while the business climate is getting better, while investors are coming and we hope that reforms will allow that to happen. So the question is, how do we engage people, maybe through outsourcing or through some other thing, uh, maybe through s creating some special economic zones. So what are the instruments 
maybe not uh, throughout the country, but uh, which would allow people to make money without the infrastructure that you're mentioning? Kind of the basic idea that the special zone is a special place where you can have special kind of protection and rights. So like on the legal thing, is that like if you are worried about it, maybe you can't fix the entire law of the whole country, uh, but maybe you can do something different in a local area and that you can create a, you know, a, a special reputation, like its own court that would uh, do IP re resolution, sort of new, new, if you have a, a fight about your intellectual property, you would have a special court uh, in this area and that would be, a, a, and a foreign judge would be responsible for it. And actually we see that in a lot of countries. So I think that it's, you can't, if you, you can't try to do everything all at the same time, but do a special thing in a special place, I think it's really possible. And, uh, and of course, digital means global. So all, in order to, to run a digital company, you just need good fiber, uh, <laughs> and you need uh, talent, uh, and you need, uh, you know, yeah, legal safety. <laughs> So. so you work in China and in Ukraine, but uh, China has a, a large uh, investor and we know that in Africa and it's building a lot of uh, things, infrastructure in Africa and in Russia, uh, but at the same time it, it's creating some sort of demographic expansion and uh, people in Ukraine are afraid of this tendency. The question is, how can we deal with China? without uh, pushing, w without av avoiding uh, China pushing its own interests? Or maybe yeah. there are some other things. Everybody does that. Um, so, um, but I think, you know, there's two Chinas. There's the big state company China, which is the infrastructure players, the guys who make, you know, high-speed rail or you know, strong smart grid. So those, that, that's state enterprise. And it's basically government to government stuff. <laughs> So the government needs to decide how does it want to play. Uh, if China says, "Hey, I'll build you a port," you know, fine, okay. What do you do? I want it, and if I get it, what is it? You know, how do I use it? How do I make more economic development? But actually, that's the small part of China's investment. We just did some research on this. Most Chinese investment is private. Uh, it's small guys from coastal China who you run over to wherever, um, and they they are. They are risk takers. They take a lot of risk. Uh, they try to get their money back in three years. Um, they typically employ 80% local because it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, you know, they, they are in manufacturing. It's a big part of that, so small Chinese manufacturers. And they are very competitive they make, and it, because the market isn't very competitive. So they can come in and they can make their money back in three years. <laughs> and they get a 40% IRR, <laughs> they're very happy about it. So that's the, I think from a Ukraine perspective, you gotta realize that those are the guys that actually make, make the business work as the, uh, the private uh, entrepre Chinese entrepreneur. Okay. And uh, in what areas do Chinese entrepreneurs want to invest in Ukraine, for example? Who should hope for these Chinese investments in Ukraine? Investing in something. So, I mean, that first of all, they look at investing in consumer income, you know, creates demand. So, you know, beer <laughs> or, you know, the textile machinery or, you know, whatever, as Ukraine develops, it's going to need a lot of stuff. Uh, and Chinese companies can make that stuff. So mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's one thing I think that they, they like to invest in. Um, and uh, then there are companies in Ukraine which are very strong. They have good technology. Uh, like aerospace and aviation, they are certainly interested in that. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's agriculture, of course, and there's lots of food processing you could buy. So Chinese companies are very practical. They just want the money. Uh, and you know, they, they would like to use Ukraine as a stepping stone to Europe, some of the FTA. So you know, it's quite... So what I'm only saying is China's kind of very businesslike about this. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you've got an expansion project that says, hey, I think I need more capital to double my factory or something. Hey, the Chinese would be quite happy to talk about that. And mm -hmm. then it's up to you to figure out how you do the deal. So you Regarding improving business climate and investment attractiveness and so on. So there is, Ukraine has been independent for 26 years, 21 uh, parliaments, uh, eight uh, parliaments, five presidents, and nothing has changed. 
Uh, so there are political, um, some sort of people pledge something, but uh, we have industrial parks and uh, free economic zones I mentioned, but they're not developing. Are there any precedents in the world uh, when, despite political we would create oasis of development? For example, uh, for example, there is the idea of uh, Hong Kong. So the city like a charter which does not uh, comply with the uh, national authorities and in this case it is it becomes an oasis for development or we're speaking about attracting foreign companies to do some governmental functions for example now we're discussing customs to be um, outsourced to Europe so to say or the judicial system we could implement a different uh, jurisdiction of another country. Are there such precedents? How how we can avoid um, how can avoid government so that the functions of the government could be done in a quality level? Is it's, it's always easier to, to uh, build a new thing than to try to fix an old thing. <laughs> you try to fix an old thing, you have lots of problems, and people are not they don't like to change. And so, but a new thing, you know, where you can start a new business with young people. I actually think a lot of this is generational. <laughs> So people between the ages of 23 and 35 have a very different view on business than people in Ukraine, I think, between the ages of 45 and 60. <laughs> and so, you know, I think, and you will find, you know, young people in young businesses, which is basically information technology. So that, you know, that for me would be the obvious. You just go after, you know, new IT businesses and media businesses and even professional services businesses, design businesses, and these are things where people know how to know how to do business, and they, they 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 have talents, and so yeah, why not Ukraine design? You know, I think Ukraine design has very interesting opportunities. So. Well, what I mean is that um, install some to to create some to create some some governmental services as tax office, for example, customs police, court, and to create um, um, services of international companies to provide these state services. Are there precedents like this? This is a PPP idea, and so that you can use a, a foreign company like a Securitas or uh, Violia, and they can do things for you in, uh, in, in, in security and uh, in water or whatever. So, yeah, I think that's possible, but you can't, I don't think we can substitute private enterprise for the role of government that government has to still do its job. Uh, and that is a job that is about ensuring stability and a competitive environment. So they got to do it. And I, I just think that you know, it's, if you can't do it nationally, at least do it locally. <laughs> and then you can create a good brand, a good local brand. And entrepreneurs will come locally, and they will, they will look for that. So I, and I, I, the other thing about this, of course, is that uh, post-Soviet economies have a unique characteristic uh, which is the uh, presence of uh, oligarchy. <laughs> so, so I don't believe I don't buy the idea that there is no money in the Ukraine. <laughs> there is a lot of money that comes from the Ukraine. It's just not in the Ukraine. <laughs> uh, so, I think if you are you know interested in developing the economy, you got to work with the people who have the money. And it's yeah. like this is a this is kind of the deal. You get to have a know, preferred position, you know, a trade partnership or something, but you also have to build a university or something. So, and that, so yeah, you can do that. Yesterday, you mentioned 440 cities that produce 50% of the global GDP. I read the McKinsey report about the fact that by 20. 20 or 25 such cities will be 600 which will accumulate 60 percent of the global gdp and uh, the next uh, 400 just five percent so there will be a global gap between cities and the entire world in ukraine have you done some sort of analysis or uh, within some other research of of other companies maybe who want to invest into Ukrainian cities, what cities of Ukraine have the potential to enter this uh, amount of global uh, city or no cities in Ukraine have the possibility to join this community? 
I think absolutely Ukrainian cities have great opportunities to grow and to get better at what they do uh, and attract investment. So, I mean, and it already happens, right? I mean, if we in Kiev, when you walk down from St. Michael's, you're gonna see all of the new residential development and it's decent stuff, it's okay, it's not bad. And so there are rich people who will buy this and so you will create that development. Well, what I worry, if I do worry, is that you know, we need to make sure that the development is uh, sustainable. So, you know, it needs to be integrated with mass transit, for example. So, you know, how many, I don't know how many subways exist uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, but that's kind of a, an issue. Uh, and then there is, of course, green, green and everything, green energy and, and, uh, and water and waste management and all that is something government can make sure that it happens. And sort of they say, you know, we expect that this city will use this kind of technology and will clean the place up. So, well, I mean, cities are the places where people invent new things and use them. And uh, so that's for true for Ukraine like anywhere else. Uh, and when I look, I see, yeah, you have a lot of investment opportunity here. <laughs> I know that uh, McKinsey created uh, an entire strategy for China to create such mega cities, such uh, development centers. Is it possible to adapt uh, this strategy quickly for Ukraine? Can we speak about some sort of um, um, uh, 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 um, like w now we're having a, a decentralization process, but nobody knows what to do? Is it possible to develop such roadmap? for Ukraine, for the local authorities, and how much does it cost? I can see his work. <laughs> so um, the work that we did in China was all about answering one question, is uh, what kind of cities do we want? Do we want lots and lots and lots of very small cities, or do we want a few very big cities, so mega cities? And you know, what are the pros and cons of you know, the different types of structures? And we concluded that we thought a cluster was the right approach, where you have a large city, but you also have 10 or 20 or 30 small cities around it. And that way you get complementarity. You can have a small city doing things that are less expensive, and gonna have a large city doing financial services. So, I mean, but that way you don't, you have a more balanced uh, growth pattern. So that, I think that, that research was, was effective. It was about, as you say, about 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. um, it worked. Uh, and I would assume that you know, Ukraine has a similar kind of thinking about whether or not you should have how much big highways you should have uh, across, the, uh, across the country and what is the impact on pollution uh, and what is the impact on skills? And yeah, so these are the kind of things that we evaluated. So yeah, no, I'd be happy to talk mm -hmm. about that for Ukraine. <laughs> okay. Actually, the previous panel mentioned that now we have a lot of court proceedings with uh, large consulting companies about the fact that they falsify or hide some facts of audit reports and uh, thus undermining uh, the uh, trust to global consulting. So please tell me, have you, has McKinsey faced such uh, stories, such cases, and whom do we trust? Is it possible to trust now to the reports of the big four? I don't know anything about my competitors. I, I never work with them and I haven't worked for them. Uh, so I honestly don't know. Um, and I, of course, from our view, we are trying to be as independent and as objective as we possibly can. So uh, that's a, that's a repu reputation kind of issue. <laughs> Thank you. That was a provocative question, especially for you, in order to, well, regarding uh, recipes, recipes for power. People love them here. In, in other words, um, those people in power create um, a network of offices at every ministry. They're financed by the European institution and you can uh, hire people uh, who will write plans and strategies because, um, well, the governmental authorities do not allow such things to develop. That is why everyone loves recipes and plans. So from you, what are the top three key changes? that uh, the authorities of different level, maybe it will be within the competency of the cabinet of ministers, of president of the parliament, but what basic things must be done that can be done quickly? Not within 10 years, 
requiring billions of investment, but what can be done quickly in the regulatory policy? What um, can be done in the institutional system in order to speed up the development? Agencies and reforming institutions such as the state financial services system and the tax, tax people or the customs people, these are easy, not easy, these are possible to do within a two to three year time. Uh, and it's a combination of new people and new technology and lots of transparency and lots of you know, key performance indicators to say how are things going and some incentives. Some, you know, for the people in government to say, hey, you know, we expect you to do a new thing here and we'll pay you to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's better for everybody if you learn how to use technology to improve the quality of your tax collection process. And, uh, that kind of thing. Regarding transparency and KPI, Ukraine does not have uh, the e-government system. They are speaking a lot about it for many years. They wanted to take the Estonian system of the e-government and they wanted to install in 2010, but now things have not uh, um, are not going further. Some people are saying that it's too expensive. Uh, well, there is no political will, many different reasons. Please tell me, what could you advise in this respect to invite a big player, for example, Microsoft or IBM, Hewlett Packard, and install their decisions or to take um, this, such a decision from other countries in order uh, for us to continue going with the process. Just outsource it to IBM or Hewlett Packard or somebody or Cisco. They, they, they are just a technology provider. They're not a government. <laughs> and so I, you know, I've seen a lot of problems when that, those things get confused. <laughs> so the, uh, you know, I think that the uh, projects are important. So what is the project that you try? And scoping the project in a way which allows you to be very clear about what's the goal and how long is it going to take? Uh, but these are standards. The requirements of the system are quite standard, aren't they? This matter has long been uh, solved in many civilized countries. So why do we reinvent the wheel? Ukraine, uh, if people do something with, on their own, it is usually done. I wouldn't say badly, but uh, many issues arise on how people do things in Ukraine. So maybe something we, we could take from other countries and adopt uh, such systems. I don't know Ukraine enough to give you a good answer, but I would say that it's always about accountability. And the person who is responsible for the project has to be re totally responsible for the project. And if the project fails, then this person should be failing. And uh, that, you know, so good capital projects are, you know, can be five years, 10 years, they take a long time sometimes. And for politicians, sometimes they're there now and then they leave. <laughs> and so the point is like if you're in a bank and you make a bad loan, uh, then your bank manager knows that this loan officer made a bad loan. And it follows that loan officer around for the next, for the whole career. It's a, so same thing in government. The government guy makes a bad decision around project management. <laughs> yes, but the problem is that election is once every five years and you can um, you can clear the... Uh, so basically you can remove the people who are relevant once every five years. But in a company, the shareholders can meet uh, every day if they don't like the indicators of how the companies work. The question is, maybe we could uh, transfer the corporate experience of uh, fast management transfer to the work um, which do not have institutionally developed status. What I mean is that Western countries um, keep the political promises and it, they are not violated as they are in Ukraine. And here everyone understands that what people have in their political agenda is not what will happen once the political person is uh, elected. So maybe some corporate instrument can be there. And uh, whether you do that by creating a separate company or a separate air region or something, but it, has, it can't be part of the whole political process. And um, so that would be my, I mean, that's what large cities do in New York or San Francisco or 
uh, London. As they, they set up companies that are responsible for the project. And, uh, and so they don't have to use the state system uh, mm -hmm. to hire people. Uh, and they can pay them with more incentives. And they can be a lot more transparent about how things are going. <laughs> So I think that's in other words, we can hire a company which would implement e-government in the country and will be accountable so no government officials will be doing it. I mean, I think that we see that the Nordics, Denmark does that and uh, Norway does that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think there, there are some good, good examples of how you can do that. Again, I would like to remember about how state services are substituted um, with uh, services of international companies for example made the epoch in Japan when they had nothing and they invited for development uh, of uh, education system and state management they invited professionals from the US and for 10 years the creation from scratch uh, was was taking place and then um, new people emerged, the Japanese people, and the system started to work. If we take uh, the... If, are there any precedents in the uh, recent future when councillors uh, were invited into different governmental institutions, representatives of other governments, who taught uh, the local people and work together with them and transfer their experience and transfer the institutions which were created to the people of the territory where they worked. Are there any precedents like this? Uh, firms that are, that you have this for uh, utilities, uh, you have it for transport, so I think they're for buildings management, facilities, so a lot of, uh, a lot of private companies are willing to work with government to improve efficiency. The, the trick or the difficulty is that you have to be again very clear about the goals. So for example prisons. Mm -hmm. uh, in the US we have a lot of private companies that, in, that manage prisons. And, but the question is why do you have a prison? What's the point? Is it punitive? You're trying to punish someone? <laughs> Are you trying to educate them? More uh, prison or more you, money. Yeah well I mean. <laughs> The, uh, that means that if you don't have that clear, then you put a private company in, they're just basically going to try to make more money. <laughs> yes. And so they will try to cut the cost. And you know, that may not be the thing you want to do. I mean, if you're like in Norway, you wouldn't do that. You know, so you want to you know, help people rehabilitate. So just as an example. So yeah, I think the main point is that PPPs need to have a very clear consensus about what is the why, why do this thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, what am I going to, how am I going to measure success? So. Thank you. Uh, regarding the volumes of investment necessary to develop a country, according to research, Ukraine has um, wear and tear of 80% uh, of wear and tear in the industrial sector. Everything exists everywhere, but uh, it, there is a high level of wear and tear. And in order to um, to bring the agriculture to the same level of uh, Western countries, which has a lot of expert. So for example, m modernizing in, um, industry requires big investment. The question is, do you have data uh, about what sums we can be speaking, the sums of investment to Ukraine? Because globally, nobody has calculated how much Ukraine needed to attract this investment in order to become competitive very quickly regarding um, infrastructure, what, how much investment is needed? Um, the global average spending on infrastructure is something like six or seven percent every year. So, the, and by that, the, that's a broad definition. That's roads and that's power and it's energy and it's telecoms and so a lot of stuff. So about six or seven percent. Uh, China is at nine percent. Uh, the U.S. is at three percent. So it's kind of, so I don't know where Ukraine is, you should check. Um, <laughs> thing is that our GDP is really small and uh, there, uh, if you, we, we can't speak about uh, the percentage of GDP, it's irrelevant because in, in Ukraine it could be 50% of GDP. Undervalued right now.
So, I mean, so because of the currency movement. So, I mean, it's clearly undervalued. So I think that's a year by year, maybe not make so much sense. But what I would generally look at is the, uh, the share of, uh, you know, the stock of infrastructure compared to the size of the GDP. And that's a number of, so I, the global average again is about 70%. So typically, on average, all of the infrastructure that you've spent money on usually should be about 70% of GDP mm -hmm. uh, over like a, I don't know, 10-year period or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the uh, you know the way to know whether you're kind of roughly in line. And uh, I mean, I just apart from looking at quality indicators, you know, like the you know. Pay the, the speed of roads and the congestion and the, the quality of the water and all those things, which are, are really important and you should you know, build them. But this is a country where you obviously have a lot of economic upside. <laughs> it's just, I mean, pretty clear. A, and for, relative to 3,000 GDP per capita in Europe with 140,000 engineers and every year, it's like clearly this is not, you know, it shouldn't be like that. So, I mean, I think that you can sort of say, what would it take? Um, and you know, if I wanted to go to 10,000 GDP per capita, mm -hmm. I would have to spend this much money <laughs> on infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And could I do that? You know, would there be a place that I could get it from? And yes. you know, I think it's interesting to ask the question. I think there are places where you can get a lot of it from, so. <laughs> uh, and not really from the EBRD. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, uh, you You mentioned. Uh, are being undervalued, Ukraine being undervalued, and also GDP, uh, the currency, in nominal dollars. This uh, currency fluctuation was very rapid. Within a few months, our GDP and uh, income per capita has fallen. Is there a quick way to recover the value of hryvna at the global market? About productivity growth, and so like our, you know, so looking at Ukrainian companies, saying which are the companies that are going to be able to compete most successfully right now, because you just lower their costs by 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 seventy percent, so they really should be able to compete, and as they compete, they should be very profitable, and that that you know would be the the way which people say, oh, and it's getting you know it's more profitable, therefore it's more expensive, and uh, private you know so buying companies is no longer as cheap as it used to be. Um, and that's how the currency just gets more valuable. Uh, <laughs> thing is that this decrease was very rapid and the growth will be very small, right? Because according to the latest uh, reports of IMF, we have 10 years before the currency of Hryvna uh, restores. Maybe it's an Im the question of image. Maybe there will be some political shift. The bank have been telling China that to slow down for 30 years, and uh, <laughs> China just doesn't listen. So, so they are, I think, very frustrated. So, the World Bank and the IMF. So, no, I don't. I don't. I mean, I think that you have to think about the opportunity again, and you know, what kind of businesses could you grow, and if you can use this opportunity. Well, there's a mayor of Chicago used to say, "It's a shame to waste a good crisis." <laughs> If you have a crisis, you can do special things. You can do things differently. So mm -hmm. maybe we have a crisis. Maybe we can do things differently. <laughs> Let's speak about steps of the business in the conditions when the country is lagging behind, in the government lagging, lagging behind of attracting investment, on promoting inner products on external markets. How can Ukrainian entrepreneurs or the large business independently attract investment, what must be done practically? In other words, where is the global capital? How is it possible to create tools, due diligence reports, what can be done, uh, attract big four? How we can uh, act, find new markets without the government and attract new investments? I, I'm sh I think I got what you were saying, I'm not sure. But I, the, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of this is about, again, transparency and accountability. And so in this case, we have large, prior profitable private companies. Uh, and so they have to, uh, it, would, it would be like fighting with one hand tied behind your back if you were not to use them. It's like, you know, okay, this is a huge pile of capital. It's like, uh, so why not, why not use it mm -hmm. uh, to uh, develop regions and develop industries? And so regions mm -hmm. and industries. So. I, I don't think that there is, again, any magic about economic development. I mean, it's, it's just a lot of hard work, and we have to 
in a focus on competitive advantage. What are the things that Ukraine can do well, competing with Russia, competing with Germany, competing with the uh, Middle East? I mean, so right. what is it that we will be world best at? And uh, there's a lot of good entrepreneur here. So, I mean, I, I think that's the basic idea. So you try to support the, support the competitive uh, companies and you do not, I mean, if you want to spend money on the uncompetitive companies, well, you know, that's a social issue. <laughs> And in China, you know, we sort of look at social issues and we say, how bad is it? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's okay. You know, so, yeah, it should be a social issue. It's like, bad company. We should not, <laughs> we should not keep spending money on this. It's just, it's wasting our money. Uh, and sometimes you, you, you help. Sometimes you, you help. So I, I think that for Ukraine, that we, you know, we can and could develop new companies, new industries, very competitive, and uh, and that you know that should be the focus for any economic strategy uh, for for the country. Thank you. Uh, Recently, McKinsey has done a report in which it showed that 30 percent of all the existing workplaces can be automated already now. It's only a matter of whether it's worth doing from the economical point of view or not, and this is for this is up to the owners of the companies to, de to decide. Ukraine has many people uh, working in, for example, in agriculture. It um, employs 15% of the country, although in developed countries it's only 3%. So there is a dilemma. If now we will try to invest uh, a lot to um, to make our business more technological advanced. In this case, a large number of low qualified people will be in the street. So how does this contradiction work? A little exaggerated because basically we think there's enough demand to create new jobs that will be bigger than the destruction of the old jobs. So there's a lot of job, old jobs and activities that will disappear. Uh, yeah. And that has been always the case. So we don't have any more horse and buggy drivers, <laughs> and uh, we don't have many telephone operators. So that happens. Uh, but when you look at the demand side, you could say, how much demand is there for wages? And it's quite large. And the thing is, we don't know what it is. <laughs> we don't know what the new job is. You know, Angry Birds or you know the uh, yoga therapy or. <laughs> I will clarify the question just a bit. For example, I created uh, the Britain strategy about creating jobs in creative economy because they, are, they can't be automated. They're planning to create one million uh, jobs in these areas, but the technical equipment of uh, the business of the UK is much higher than that of Ukraine. And this gap, in other words, the number of people that will be created even if a basic automation appears in Ukraine and the developed world, these are different figures. In other words, we have many more people and uh, people will not start developing Angry Birds, all of them, and start making money on that. Uh, it's just an attitude, sort of, do you want to use the technology or not? And, you know, if you don't, then you're at a disadvantage. <laughs> so the bank, if the banks don't use AI and machine learning, they're not going to be around. <laughs> They don't have a choice. So many industries are like that. So I think basically the, uh, uh, the, 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 the discussion about jobs is usually not taking into account the new jobs because we can't really measure them. Um, and, you know, it's again an attitude. I was with the mayor, a deputy prime minister of Singapore and the mayor of Hamburg, and we were talking about you know, banking and online banking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they, you know, the question was, Will old people use online banking? Uh, and the uh, Hamburg mayor said, uh, well, of course, it's difficult. So that's why we always want to keep one human teller, you know, person in the bank, so that when grandma, grandma goes into the bank, she has a human person that she can talk to. Mm -hmm. And the Singaporean was very upset. <laughs> he says it's a completely wrong way of thinking because our philosophy is that no old person should be left behind. <laughs> if you are saying that old people cannot learn, well, you know, you are, you are dissing the old people. <laughs> You're disrespecting the old people. Mm -hmm. And if grandma needs some help, fine. We'll get a teenager to sit next to them <laughs> and help her figure out how to do online banking. So I, mean, I think this is really an attitude issue. I'm not saying one is right or wrong, 
but that is actually the, the conversation. So, and I, I, as I said, I, I think the issue is not whether there will be jobs, actually, there will be jobs, it's the price. Mm -hmm. Because we may not have as many high wage jobs. We might have a lot of low wage jobs, mm -hmm. like baristas. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that is the problem. So, and how do you educate again, back to that, everybody, so they can get high wage jobs? They can use that skill. So that's, that's where we're coming from. Well, this question, I, I ask this question in relation to democratic question. Now the developed countries are declining in population and prior to automatization, the developed countries are sucking uh, the, the human capital out of uh, the least developed countries and workforce as well. And Ukraine has felt it very greatly because now Poland employs more than 100 million Ukrainian citizens. And also the Poles themselves leave for Germany and other EU countries. In your opinion, will this tendency remain or will it shorten um, because of the automatization, which will reduce the necessity in workforce. Because if we extrapolate the tendencies which exist in migration right now, we have a very um, bad picture. We have a total depopulation of uh, developing countries. Maybe it's slightly exaggerated and automatization will decrease this tendency. What is your opinion? As I said, I think it, that the impact of automation is less than the impact of increased demand consumer demand. So, but people don't move to Poland. They move to Warsaw or to Lodz <laughs> or to Krakow. And why did they go? Because they got a job <laughs> and they have a better quality job and that they can use the better quality infrastructure. They can use better quality tools. You have a more demanding customer. Mm -hmm. So it builds their skill and they go there. So I think that's the problem again. I, I just think that Ukraine needs to focus on creating vibrant local economies that will demand higher skills and better quality production and, and use the technology. And then you have, a, then they stay. Uh, so I, it's, a, it's not, it, it's really not a uh, complicated conversation in that sense. You know, that if, we're, if people are leaving, they vote with their feet mm -hmm. and they just don't think that they have as much of an opportunity here. Um, and actually from a, an economist's point of view, migra migrants are very successful people. <laughs> migrants are the kind of people that you want to attract. So the people who are leaving, those are very resilient and high productivity growth, growth. Maybe not low high productivity, but high productivity growth. And hey, you know, that's a, how can I get you to stay? Uh, what would be, what would it take for us to develop a new skill here in the construction industry or something like that? So. Regarding workforce, many Ukrainian companies uh, are speaking about the fact that uh, there are not enough sufficient qualified Ukrainian personnel. In your opinion, is it risky or is it possible in Ukraine to s temporarily um, um, attract migrants for these qualified countries and how risky is it for the country if you take uh, the long-term perspective. I mean, I think the issue with migrant, you know, from a receiving company perspective is all about integration. And so if you bring these people here, how do they work? <laughs> and where do they live? And what about their kids? Do they go to school? Well, if we take uh, a cynical approach, what migrants are the most useful? Mig migrants from what countries will be able to adapt uh, in a better way in the national environment of other countries? I don't see any pattern really. I mean, I think there is no, there's no country which has a uh, approach to enter migrants that is better or worse than any other country. I mean, you can, you can have skill basis and you can have family basis and you can have geography basis and nobody actually really shows it's better or worse. Are there any some sort of filters, some systems of assessments of migrants so that it is possible to, um, while issuing the work permit? And so, you know, if you don't have a way of integrating them, then probably asking migrants to come is a bad idea <laughs> and it will create more problems uh, than otherwise. So it's more about integration, sort of when they come 
and when you want them to come. So, I mean, and as I said, you have low skill and high skill. Mm -hmm. So low skill migrants basically free up the native population. So, you know, you bring in a low skill person, now he does the bad job, the dirty, dangerous job, and the native population gets to do something better. <laughs> that's, that's why low skill people move. Uh, high skill are entrepreneurs. High skill yes. people create businesses, and uh, so that's those are just two different kinds of people, and they have a different issue on integrating them. <laughs> Recently, the report uh, of U.S. intelligence, the report saw three strategy of world development up to uh, three scenarios of world development by. 2035 there was um, a scenario of city of cities that um, temporarily replace the authority of the national governments in other words the the power of national governments is, is becoming weaker and cities are becoming stronger um, do you believe in the influence of such a form of governance and transnational cooperation between cities and not between governments how will this form be feasible? Like, is it possible that it will happen? Very controversial question. And, uh, you know, if you look at most the budgets of national economies, they're dominated by military and uh, healthcare. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, maybe that is what national budget is about, is military and healthcare. And everything else should be done by city. <laughs> in terms of spending on police or on you know, utility or, I mean, there's some other stuff, of course, like the grid, the grid is national probably. Um, but yeah, no, I think the reality is that cities are more capable of doing more stuff and so they will because they, have, they can raise money to do it and they can capture value through real estate. So, so I, I believe that, yeah, we will see more sub-national actors uh, and uh, that is kind of what uh, we also need to think about the framework for that. So my father was responsible for establishing the International Criminal Court, uh, and he was an international lawyer. And the principle was that if we have international crimes, the individual should be accountable. Even if a country does it, ultimately some individual made a decision. And that's the, that's, that was Nuremberg. Uh, said that just following orders is not a is not an excuse. <laughs> Have you encountered a country which had the tendency is quite developed where this framework of cooperation between the government and uh, free cities uh, is the same is equal? So the experience of what country can we take when um, for the future? Let's look at you know city states yeah. like Dubai or Singapore. <laughs> Uh, which are, you know, one city. This is not a relevant uh, example because it corresponds to both the country and uh, the state there. It's just one and the same, basically. And uh, they have clusters. And uh, I, I think they're just different aspects, different, uh, um, uh, let's say, different strengths. Uh, so Korea, if you look at the Seoul city government, mm -hmm. they have their own ambassador. <laughs> So they go, they have Seoul as, you know, Minister of Foreign Affairs for, just for Seoul. Mm. And uh, so that is, you know, one sort of approach. Because, and that person is responsible for representing Seoul and attracting foreign direct investment and uh, can negotiate with governments. Uh, mm. you know, that's, you know, so I think that's an interesting approach. Uh, so, and uh, By continuing the discussion, recently, I don't remember who exactly, but someone advised Elon Musk and Google to create uh, their own state because companies face well this was kind of news it sounds like a joke now but if we uh, have a look at the number of people who work in corporation which uh, are provided with uh, social insurance medicine corporate universities even in China there are whole cities where people live with the uh, restaurants and total infrastructure how uh, non-utopic is the emergence of some territories that are controlled by corporations. Is it possible for the state to be, that the states will um, give uh, some territories for corporations to develop? I think that that works. Um, I think what, what does work is for companies to invest in communities 
And so if you look at Facebook or Google now, they're building houses. <laughs> and uh, they are trying to, because they don't otherwise have any place for their employees to live. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you know, we did this before, Henry Ford uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Pullman. So yeah, I mean, I think investing in infrastructure for, city, you know, for, for society certainly is something that we can see. Uh, companies doing. But again, substituting for government, you get back into this issue of, okay, so now you have a private company that is running the fire department. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, who do they, if they have a fire, who do they save first? <laughs> uh, do they save the rich guy who's got, you know, a lot of money and a lot of taxes, or do they save the poor guy? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know. You know, some companies might do one way or do the other way. And so that that is what I think is you know that's the reason why a lot of it's a, a lot of uh, new cities you know, have to sort of think about the role of the public good. You know what is the public good? So. In this regard, there is a, an instrument of a cooperative of SOP, and as far as I know, it's a big tendency in the world when the shares of the company are sold to its employees, and um, employees um, also are co um, they take part in the, in managing the company so the matter of corporate cities is um, solved with co-managing isn't it the corporate cities at this point and, and I think you could you know but then what about beneficiary management what if someone leaves the company <laughs> and they leave the leave the city and what if their kids are going to school? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or what if they have an old person at home and they need to you know, have regular treatment? So, uh, the company really starts to become a, you know, a public sector enterprise, and I don't think you know Elon wants to do that. <laughs> I don't think he wants to be a public sector enterprise. Я так понимаю, что наше время заканчивается, да? As far as I understand, we're running out of time. So the final question. I believe that our participants of the conference, it's very useful for them to hear from well an expert from a guru some recommendations for them personally how in the conditions in the country where you are located how to develop your full potential what would you wish to participants of the conference to do in order to be as fully developed in the environment which you heard which you have been hearing for the second time as possible i get it um but I would hope that basically, again, economic development is just a lot of hard work. <laughs> and it has to be based on competitive advantage. And so everybody here should think about what is the huge opportunity they have right now you know, to serve the emerging markets, to take advantage of the, of the talent, uh, to you know, be, build new infrastructure, because it's a lot cheaper now than it was before. <laughs> um, so. There's a lot of opportunity, but with that, I think you should have, the main thing is to have a high aspiration. China was at 3,000 GDP per capita. It grew at 10% a year uh, for 20 years. <laughs> so I wonder, why wouldn't Ukraine? Why wouldn't you, why does Ukraine think it can only grow at one or 2%? So, because you have the opportunity. So I just sort of think that there is a lot of op opportunity here to do more and to have a higher aspiration. And if that means that, you know, the industry structure needs to change and that, you know, powerful people need to be persuaded to join and to, to help and to support, well, great. That's good. So, I mean, I think that this is a conversation and the conversation is going to continue and, you know, I think it, it will be, you know, I, I'm always an optimist. So, I mean, I just think mainly be optimistic about the opportunity here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all.